Good day. My name is Aisha Millette. I'm the director of a task force at Global Affairs to establish a center for democracy. It's my pleasure to moderate today's event. I'd like to begin, of course, by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathering here is the unceded traditional territories, the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. I recognize that participants may be uh, enjoying this event from different parts of the country, and therefore you may be working on a different uh, Indigenous territory. I encourage you to take a moment to think about how uh, you are living reconciliation in your life. For myself particularly, I like to think about reading to learn more, uh, supporting Indigenous-led businesses, and using my position within my institution to advocate for justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. And I hope you all take the time to do that as well uh, and make our acknowledgements uh, in living reality. For those of you with uh, accessibility challenges, I will just note that I'm an Indian woman, I have brown hair, I wear glasses, and I'm wearing a teal dress with a colorful necklace. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce today's event entitled The Emergence of Populism and Democracies, which is the fourth event in the series of Future of Democracy put on by the Canada School of Public Service. Over the past 20 years, we have seen a significant rise of populist parties across the political spectrum. I'm ha happy to be here today to moderate this very timely topic and contribute to better understanding the policy challenges that currently face our democracy. We have a great discussion planned today uh, and want therefore to make sure you have the best possible experience. I'll start with a quick couple of housekeeping uh, points to go over. Uh, today's event will be in English with some French portions, uh, simultaneous interpretation, SI, as well as CART, which is real-time captioning services, um, are available to you to enjoy this event uh, in the language of your choice. Uh, so to access these features, please click on the respective icons directly from your webcast interface. Uh, and if you are on the English interface and realize that at some point you might need some simultaneous interpretation support, uh, please return to the home page of this webcasting platform to re-access the event with SI or simultaneous interpretation. Uh, you may refer to the reminder email at any time if you need any further support. Uh, to optimize your viewing experience, we would recommend you disconnect from your VPN or use a personal device. Uh, to watch the session uh, when possible. If you're experiencing any technical issues, uh, it is recommended that you relaunch the webcast link, uh, you know, relaunch the webcast using the link uh, provided to you. Now, uh, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor uh, Bart Bonikowski, um, who's gonna lead us off with a, a, a brief uh, presentation. Uh, professor Bonikowski is an associate professor of sociology and politics at New York University um, and using relational survey methods, computational text analysis, uh, and experimental research, uh, his work applies insights from cultural sociology and the study of politics uh, in the United States and Europe with a particular focus on nationalism, populism, and right-wing parties. Uh, professor Bonikowski, over to you. Can't wait to hear you have to say. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, and speak with you about a topic that I find particularly interesting and important um, in the current historical moment, and that is the rise of radical right parties across contemporary democracies. Um, the, the themes I'll cover are um, how we should think about what radical right politics is, that is, what are its core components. Um, I'll also talk about how we might explain the rise of these parties, their mainstreaming across a wide range of countries today in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and then I'll, I'll point to some uh, potential dangers that are associated with this, with this form of politics with respect to uh, the integrity of liberal democratic institutions. So the talk really begins with an observation with which many of you are, uh, uh, of course, familiar, uh, that the number of radical right parties, number of radical right actors has been multiplying across a wide range of uh, contemporary democracies over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, in Western Europe, countries um, such as the Netherlands, uh, Austria, France, the United Kingdom, in Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, but of course, um, uh, closer to home in North America as well, we've seen the rise of radical right politics in the United States with uh, Donald Trump's capture of the Republican Party and his election to the presidency. And so this proliferation and mainstreaming of radical right actors and parties uh, raises three fundamental questions that I would like to discuss with you today. The first is, what is the radical right? How do we think about this form of politics? What are its core components? Um, and then that 
directly leads to the second question, that is, why has this form of politics been surging? Why has it become mainstream in the current historical moment? And, and I hope to, um, to provide you with a, at least a tentative answer in the form of a, of a theoretical model that I've been working on um, and, and, uh, and addressing with empirical evidence for the last uh, 10 years or so. And the final question, of course, is what are the consequences of the entry of these parties into the political mainstream? What impact might these parties have on democratic governance, on liberal rights regimes, uh, and on the future of politics uh, across Europe and the United States and beyond? So uh, let me begin with the first question, and that is, what is the radical right? How do we think about this uh, form of politics? And I would argue uh, that the radical right really has three core components. The first is populism. Uh, now, populism is a term that's frequently used in the media and scholarship, uh, and it's typically defined uh, as the way of doing politics that's predicated on a moral binary, on a moral distinction between some sort of a vilified elite and the virtuous people. Um, and, and the argument is that the elites are essentially compromised. Uh, they no longer represent the people's interests, and therefore they should be removed from power. And in turn, the people should gain unmediated access to political institutions. Now, populism takes on a variety of forms, uh, and which elites are vilified uh, itself varies. So on the left, for example, um, in, in radical left discourse, uh, uh, populism typically vilifies um, economic elites, right? So um, business leaders, Wall Street fat cats, and so forth. Um, on the right, uh, populism typically vilifies uh, politicians, bureaucrats, and sometimes uh, uh, claims that, uh, that these political elites are in cahoots with various minority groups. So this is, this is the first component of radical right politics uh, that is quite prevalent uh, across radical right parties uh, from, from a variety of countries. The second component that I want to turn your attention to is authoritarianism. And by authoritarianism, we really mean a, a form of governance, a way of doing um, politics once a party is in power. And typically, this involves um, a, a persistent violation of liberal democratic norms and practices. Uh, anything from threatening to jail your political opponents through to using the full power of, uh, of the government against minorities, um, also uh, scaling back um, the independence of, of the media, of the judiciary, and so forth. Uh, now, this is a form of governance, that is, this is how political parties rule once in power, um, radical right parties in particular, but these uh, these these institutional uh, measures are often communicated in electoral discourse as well. So radical right parties will uh, try to assure their uh, constituents, their supporters, that once in power, if elected, they will be willing to do anything to pursue their supporters' interests, including uh, violating the norms uh, uh, and, and standard practices of liberal democracy. There's also a third element, which I think is actually quite um, central to our uh, uh, understanding and, and explaining the rise of radical right politics, and that is nationalism. Um, what I mean by this is a little uh, a little more complex, so I want to spend a couple of minutes on it. Uh, so nationalism means many things to many people. Uh, in the way I'm using the term, uh, I'm really referring to the way in which citizens of countries, residents of countries, understand their nation. That is, when one thinks Canada or America or Germany, what comes to mind? Uh, and these understandings of the nation uh, are, are composed of, of a variety of, of beliefs and attitudes. Uh, some of these have to do with national membership. That is, who gets to be a leg legitimate member of the nation? Uh, do we care about things like religion, like language, like ethnic or racial background, uh, when deeming someone uh, legitimately Canadian or American or German or, or whatever? Or is membership in the nation open to anyone who feels a subjective identification with a nation? So some, some scholars uh, have referred to this distinction as ethnic nationalism versus civic nationalism. Ethnic nationalism based on ascriptive criteria of belonging, civic nationalism based on uh, elective criteria of belonging. So that's one set of, uh, of beliefs and attitudes and preferences that shape how people understand their nation. But that's not all. That does not exhaust the, the range of nationalist beliefs. There are also questions of, of how people understand their state, whether they're proud of the state, uh, the government, uh, or whether they view it, view it with skepticism. So in the United States, uh, there's a long tradition of anti-statist ideology, anti-statist beliefs, this kind of uh, a view that the, that, the, that the government does not represent us, the government doesn't understand us, that the government should be um, 
critiqued and uh, and it should not be allowed to expand in terms of uh, its scope of of of, um, of governance. Uh, so that's one set of beliefs. On the other hand, there are others who are proud of the state and, be- and believe that it's uh, it's sort of a core component of what the American uh, nation is all about. Uh, and there are other domains of, of national pride or, or lack thereof, uh, ranging from the accomplishments in the arts and literature, economic uh, accomplishments, the state of the democracy and democratic institutions in general. So the point here is that a lot Along with criteria of national belonging, legitimate national belonging, conceptions of nationhood also involve these domain-specific uh, uh, feelings of pride. In addition to that, there are also beliefs about the nation's place in the global community. So, for instance, should we think of, of the military uh, as a policeman of the world or as a humanitarian force that, um, that offers aid to other countries in need? Um, how do we think about the, the, our nations, our countries' um, place in kind of a global hierarchy, economic hierarchy, or otherwise? So all of these ideas about legitimate membership, about domain-specific national pride or their uh, lack thereof, and about um, the nation's place in the world and, and sometimes nation's superiority to other countries, um, referred to as chauvinism, all of these attitudes uh, uh, cohere into these cultural models of the nation, right? When one thinks Canada, all these different ideas come together into a, into a model of what the nation means to, uh, to a person. And um, in past work, I have shown that actually these cultural models of the nation, these types of uh, nationalism are heterogeneous within countries. That is, people disagree fundamentally about what their country means to them. Canadians disagree about what Canada means to them. Americans disagree internally about what America means to them. And these disagreements about different conceptions, understandings of of the nation um, constitute really important cleavages, cultural cleavages uh, in the population. Uh, These tend to be um, sort of tacit uh, and, um, and, uh, and, and not activated for most, most historical periods. But once in a while, these cultural cleavages of nationhood become politically powerful. They become uh, manifest, not just latent. That is, politicians evoke them, and the population starts thinking in terms of their nationhood, in terms of these nationalist beliefs above other identities and above other concerns. That is, the salience of nationalism increases uh, in people's political behavior, for instance, at the voting booth. And I would argue that we are in s- precisely such a c- political historical period right now, not just in the United States, but across uh, a wide range of, uh, of demo- democratic polities. That is that people are increasingly disagreeing about what the nation means, and that disagreement is increasingly shaping their political decisions. Um, and, and furthermore, I would say that this disagreement, this activation of these nationalist cleavages is really at the heart of the rise of radical right politics. So coming back again to these three components, the radical right, in my view, uh, is about populism, right, about anti-elite discourse. It's about nationalism, that is, this, this, these deep cleavages around the meaning of the nation, uh, and authoritarianism, which is the willingness to go to extreme lengths um, uh, to deliver on certain electoral promises. Um, these three components, populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism, function both at the level of attitude, that is beliefs that people hold, as well as at the level of political claims. That is, they are referenced in political campaigns that are used for mobilizing support for, for political projects. And they actually cohere together uh, because what, what politicians often do, especially in the current period, is they essentially offer a narrative whereby the nation as it is today has lost its way uh, that it is essentially on a on a on a downward decline, and um, and what that specifically means varies, but often it means that the the ethno racial majority has lost its status or its status is being threatened. And what we need to do is essentially reverse history and go back to a a, a lost kind of glory day, uh, right? So there's a nostalgic dimension to this. Who's to blame for this? Well, elites. That's the populist piece as well as minorities, that's the nationalist piece. Uh, And to regain that lost nation, we need to go to extreme measures, uh, and that is the authoritarianism piece. So that's roughly how we can think of the the content of radical right politics. And already in that conception, there's some hints as to why it's been working particularly powerfully, that narrative has been working particularly powerfully in recent years. So let's focus on that question in particular, specifically. Um, Why has the radical right been surging? And 
Here, I would offer an explanation in a nutshell that essentially uh, uh, states that national, the national cleavages that I, have, uh, ex- uh, that I have described to you are the fuel behind the rise of radical right politics. The anti-elitism and low levels of institutional trust that are part and parcel of populism uh, stoke the fire that's, that's sort of fueled initially by, by these nationalist disagreements. And then tolerance for authoritarian rule is essentially the consequence of this confluence of populism and nationalism. So nationalist cleavages are at the heart of the, of the of, of political conflict. Populism increases their salience and authoritarianism and tolerance for authoritarian rule is the consequence. So that's sort of the explanation really in, in brief. Um, one important caveat is that if one looks at the distribution of attitudes in the population over a long time across most democratic countries, um, these nationalist beliefs and populist uh, anti-elite beliefs have not really increased in the aggregate. They're actually quite stable over time. Same with authoritarianism in terms of people's beliefs. And the, the corresponding frames, political frames, have also been around for a long time, which makes this explanation a little tricky, right? How do we explain change, that is the rise, rise of radical right politics, with something that seems stable over time, both on the supply and demand side of politics? Um, and what I would argue is actually what's happened is that the pre-existing nationalist, populist, and authoritarian frames, as well as the pre-existing beliefs, have come to resonate in new ways in recent years. Now, why? Why would the resonance of these, of these frames and beliefs change over time? Um, so here, I want to I want to give you an outline of, kind of a theoretical model that that gives you some insight as to what might be happening. So, in the image that you see here on the screen, uh, at the top, I'm pointing out some supply side phenomena. That is the kinds of frames, the kinds of messages that are offered by political elites running in elections, by media elites trying to uh, to pursue certain political projects. That's the supply side at the top. On the bottom of, of the image, you see the demand side, that is popular beliefs, attitudes held by the public. On both sides, you have these three features, nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism. And now what happens over time, as I've already pointed out, for most part, there is stability. These frames have been around, these attitudes are roughly stable in the aggregate. But once you look under the surface, there is actually change. So the first thing that we can talk about is the fact that these nationalist, populist, and authoritarian frames have been recombined in new ways by political elites. So even if they've been around for a long time, what political elites have arrived at, especially radical right elites have arrived at, is kind of a winning formula. If you combine populism, nationalism, authoritarianism into a, into this uh, a particular bundle of, of narratives and ideas, kind of what I described to you earlier, it works really well. And they've arrived at this, uh, at this winning formula largely through a trial and error process. Some parties in Europe, for instance, would start with some populist rhetoric that would gain purchase. Others would start with some nationalist rhetoric that would gain purchase. Another political entrepreneur would come along, combine these frames and see that actually works quite well. Uh, And over time, these three frames have been fused essentially into a a single uh, narrative. At the same time as that's happened, these ideas have started to stand in for one another. Um, So I've got some research that shows that if you expose American uh, um, voters to just populist anti-elite claims with nothing else in them, just a critique of elites. Uh, those on the right, Republicans in particular, and Trump supporters all the more so, uh, uh, ex- exhibit greater antipathy towards minorities. That is, populism has become essentially a stand-in for, for eth- ethno-nationalism. It's become a dog whistle for exclusionary beliefs. And so these frames have been have been brought together. They've been fused in, in, in many ways in terms of standing for one in, standing in for one another. Uh, and, and that's that's uh, these are all signs of change in terms of the supply side of politics. On the demand side of politics, that is popular attitudes, beliefs, there's also been change uh, underneath that aggregate stability that I referenced earlier. For instance, um, Older identities, such as labor identities, union identities, have eroded with the decline of unions, um, specific, especially in the United States, but also in Western Europe, um, also in Canada and elsewhere. And as labor identities, I used to give people a sense of meaning, a sense of worth, have declined. I would argue nationalist identities have, uh, have filled in the gap. They've become more salient as a result. Another feature of demand side attitudes that has changed over time. This is particularly to the United States, but it's an empirical question to a degree it also uh, occurs elsewhere. Um, These conceptions of nationhood, these different models of the nation, these nationalist beliefs have become sorted by party over time. 
so that back in the 1990s, you couldn't predict whether someone is a Republican or a Democrat based on their nationalist beliefs. And um, similarly, you couldn't predict somebody's nationalist beliefs based on their partisan identity. That has changed radically over a matter of, um, of 20 years, essentially. So that at this point, and, and I have some empirical research that demonstrates this, at this point, Republicans and Democrats fundamentally disagree about what America is, what America means, what aspects of its past, of its past should, be, should be celebrated, and what future uh, America ought to pursue. Uh, so the two parties are essentially operating based on two completely different understandings of nationhood, based on two sides of this of this nationalist cleavage. So again, in the, in the aggregate, not much change, but underneath, sorting by party, erosion of old identities, greater salience of nationalist identities. At the same time, there's a wide range of contextual structural changes in society. Um, and... I say wide range because there, there's a wide range within countries, but also there's a lot of variation across countries in what uh, uh, what kinds of cultural structural changes that have occurred in the last while, in the last 30, 40 years. So these changes range from, from economic shocks, recessions, deindustrialization, uh, capital mobility, um, trade shocks, uh, a slew of, of economic phenomena, demographic changes, uh, immigration, uh, immigration flows, refugee flows, uh, as well as cultural changes, changes in terms of wh whose culture is celebrated and glorified, a shift from, in the United States, for instance, a shift from the glorification of middle America, of white working class America, uh, to a much more cosmopolitan, diverse um, depiction of American culture over time. In addition to that, you've got uh, security threats and security shocks, such as terrorist attacks, obviously, 9-11 being a particularly salient one in the U.S., but you have similar um, um, types of, uh, of attacks in other countries. So there's a whole slew of contextual changes, uh, which are important to which country varies, which are important to which faction, political faction within each country varies, but, but they create a sense of general insecurity and fear, kind of an inchoate insecurity and fear among certain segments of, of national populations. And I would, I would argue in particular among ethno-racial majorities who are starting to sort of fear that their status in society is being threatened from a variety of directions. But these fears are in Kuwait. They're not entirely articulated. And this is when, uh, in the theoretical model I'm describing to you, this is when opportunistic political elites step in. And what they do is essentially they rhetorically amplify these fears and they bundle them together into an overall sense of crisis. Um, they say you're scared of, uh, of, of terrorist attacks, you're threatened by economic shocks, uh, you worry about changes in the demographic composition of the nation or in the nation's uh, dominant culture. Um, you should be. These are all things to be scared of and they're all a symptom of a deep crisis of the nation. Um, and once they activate this fear and bundle it in this way, they also point a finger. These opportunistic political elites point a finger typically toward political uh, mainstream elites, right? They say the political establishment is to blame. And they also point a finger towards minorities. And they say the political establishment is actually in cahoots with immigrants, with ethnic and racial minorities, with the religious minorities. And these folks are getting essentially a leg up. They have the ear of the establishment in a way that people like you don't. Now, what do they mean by people like you? They typically are referencing, again, ethno-racial majorities. In the United States, in Canada, um, in Western European countries, that's typically white, uh, often Christian, uh, although that varies across countries, uh, uh, segments of the population. Essentially, what this bundling of, of these fears and anxieties together and the pointing of fingers uh, and blame, attributing blame for them, uh, what that does is it creates a sense of perceived collective status threat. That is, these, in most cases, white uh, majorities are starting to feel threatened from a variety of angles uh, in terms of their place in society. That, they, that they're losing the nation as they understand it, that they think, you know, in, in their conception, the nation belongs to them primarily, and they're losing their grasp on the nation, uh, and that um, their place in the ethno-racial hierarchy of, of their country uh, is either declining or is about to decline. Um, again, this is not just purely demographic in terms of numbers, it's also economic, it's also cultural, uh, and so forth. Once this sense of status threat is powerfully activated politically, then 
uh, that leads to a su potentially successful mobilization of these pre-existing nationalist cleavages that I told you about, right? Um, a lot of the, the, the people I'm describing, these ethno-racial majorities, have a very particular conception of what the nation means to them. And once they are threatened or they feel threatened uh, from these diverse um, uh, directions, then these conceptions of nation have become much more salient in their minds uh, as um, as in need of, of actual political action. And they start voting based on these nationalist beliefs in powerful ways. Uh, that then, of course, leads to um, the mainstreaming and, and the electoral successes of radical right parties. Um, and so the idea here is that you've got these, these, these deep cleavages in the understandings of the nation that are typically latent, but in the context of these of these rapid changes that are amplified both by political elites, they become manifest and people start acting on them and making electoral decisions based on them. Once this model starts working, that is, once these radical right parties uh, and candidates start winning elections, others in other countries are observing this and recognizing this as a potentially useful model for themselves. And the entire thing essentially diffuses across countries. That is, political actors, even if they disagree fundamentally about ideology, about policy um, um, across countries, they start drawing on the same toolkit of political rhetoric, of political mobilization, and eventually also of governance. And so the model of political mobilization starts spreading across countries, and the model of authoritarian nationalist governance also starts spreading across countries. And that's how you get uh, where we are today, which is the, the, the number of cases, of country cases, without a presence of a radical right party is decreasing over time. So people used to write doctoral dissertations on the fact that there is no radical right in Sweden. This is an exceptional case. A couple of years later... Um, uh, Sweden gets a radical right party. And the number of cases like that multiplies over time. So, so now we're in a position where there are very few contemporary democracies that don't have some sort of a presence of, of a federal level radical right party. And so um, obviously what a lot, of, uh, a lot of journalists, a lot of scholars, a lot of um, uh, everyday people are worried about is the erosion of democracy. Um, there is a real risk of liberal democracy backsliding. A lot of uh, uh, really terrific books have been written about that about this topic, most notably by um, by Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt, uh, How Democracies Die. And so the process here is basically one of death by a thousand cuts. Uh, so um, essentially, once these radical right parties uh, um, are elected, gain power, are become part of governing coalitions, or or themselves form government. Um, there is, there is a dual danger of a gradual transition to competitive authoritarianism, away from liberal democracy towards competitive authoritarianism, and also a danger of geopolitical instability, as we've seen uh, with uh, the, the war in the Ukraine, as we've seen with other, um, other military endeavors abroad. Let me talk about the first one, about the erosion of democracy. There's a wide range of threats to core norms and institutions of democratic, liberal democratic governance, threats to ju judicial autonomy, threats to the independence of media organizations, uh, threats to the peaceful transfer of power, um, to the maintenance of civil liberties, uh, um, and also of, of procedural forbearance, a threat to elites, governing elites, not using the full force of law, essentially, against their enemies, domestic, perceived domestic enemies, against minorities, but also against their political opposition. All of these are um, core features of a liberal democracy. Once these features start eroding, um, we, we get into trouble, right? We, we, we start on the slippery slope toward potential authoritarianism. Um, in addition to, of course, the backsliding of democratic institutions, there's also the danger of nationalism itself being uh, uh, fomented and leading to um, all kinds of consequences for, for group relations in a cosmopolitan, multi multicultural state. Uh, so after the election of Trump, in the United States, we saw a lot of harassment, everyday violence, domestic terrorism against minorities. With the rise of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States, as Trump vilified China for the rise of this, of this virus, um, the frequency and severity of, of Asian hate crimes increased uh, considerably, especially in, in uh, U.S. urban centers. So the threat is, so the danger is both to democratic institutions themselves 
uh, as we've seen with Trump's refusal to honor the results of the 2020 election and, uh, and the January um, 6th insurrection that followed, there's also um, a danger to, to peaceful uh, group relations um, and, and coexistence uh, uh, within a, a multicultural society. Um, I will end on, I suppose, not an optimistic note is that, you know, I think that we're, we still don't have a, a clear set of solutions to the current crisis. The solutions that do come to mind are often um, unrealistic. And so uh, I think we're in a quite a precarious situation where the radical right is going to continue being um, uh, present on the political scene. It's going to continue winning elections, although obviously it, its fortunes will ebb and flow, and liberal democracy will uh, continue being threatened in, in powerful and fundamental ways. Um, so um, I suppose the next few years will will determine the course of, of history for, for the next few decades. And very, very important in the United States, um, the 2024 election, in particular presidential election, I think will truly be a, a watershed in terms of um, the future of liberal democracy in the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, presentation. We're so thrilled um, to have had the opportunity to hear it. We've had to say a lot of thought provoking material in there. Um, we're gonna turn to our, our panel discussion now um, and I'll turn it over to our guests to introduce themselves with a little bit more detail. Uh, first, I'll, uh, I would invite um, Professor Frederic Guillaume Dufour uh, to tell us a little bit more about himself. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of um, Université du Québec à Montréal, excusez-moi, uh, and has been recognized for his excellence in teaching and his significant contributions to the Faculty of Humanities at his university. Uh, his areas of research include comparative studies on nationalism and population uh, populism, excuse me, uh, and he has published several books on the topic. Uh, Professor Frédéric Guillaume Dufour, bon après-midi, welcome. Bonjour, thanks very much. Well, that's a very good introduction, Aisha. Um, what can I add? Um, among the nationalism that I'm looking at in, per in, pit in, in particular is, uh, well, transformation of nationalism in Quebec and Canada and Western Europe in general. So most of my, my comparative work is on Canada and Germany in, in particular. Welcome, thank you. And Professor Bonikowski, perhaps I'll ask you to just add a little bit more to the introduction I provided about you earlier. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, uh, particularly in such a distinguished company. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, you've heard uh, a lot about what I do. Uh, I study politics uh, and culture from a sociological perspective, but I also, for a long time now, have uh, uh, collaborated with and uh, with political scientists and published in political science journals as well. So I'm sort of in between those two disciplines. Um, and what I try to do is bring a, a, a deeper understanding of culture to research uh, on politics um, um, and political science to try to understand under what circumstances uh, do people mobilize in support of specific political projects. In, in the case of uh, what you just heard, uh, um, and uh, I really specifically focus on the rise of, um, of the kind of politics that challenge liberal democratic norms and institutions uh, and threaten um, the stability of, of uh, democracies around the world. Wonderful. Well, you know, I, I think we should get right into it. We have a lot of questions and a lot of things to get into. Um, so perhaps I'll start, Professor Bonikowski, with you. Uh, you know, we, we've we've heard what you said in, in your, you've presented a very broad framework, but I wonder, does that same framework apply on the left? That's a great question. Um, the the talk, as, as you heard, is really about radical right politics, but the elements that, that comprise the radical right are um, present on both sides of the political spectrum, really, at least some of them. So if we think about populism, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you see both on the right and the left. Uh, and, and if you think about the history of Latin American politics, um, uh, left-wing populism was a very prominent uh, feature uh, of those countries' uh, political culture. And we see uh, left-wing populism also in Europe, uh, although not quite as prominently uh, uh, as on the right in the sense that radical right parties have just had a lot more success uh, than populist left parties. Um, in fact, some theorists, uh, Ernesto Laclau in particular, would claim that there is a seed of populism in all of socialism. So in some ways, you know, the, the, the far left uh, and, and populism are, are closely aligned. So that's, that's one element. The second element, uh, authoritarianism, 
the left is not a stranger to authoritarianism either. Um, so uh, going back through history, there's plenty, plenty of evidence of radical left movements pursuing authoritarian measures to carry out their political projects. Um, and uh, certainly there are elements of authoritarianism uh, in left politics in Latin America, but also throughout European history and beyond. Um, so I think to the degree that there is one distinguishing feature, it is exclusionary nationalism, ethno-nationalism. That is a phenomenon that is more often found on the extreme right than on the extreme left. Um, and so that, that juxtaposition of populism with authoritarianism, with ethno-nationalism, is rather uniquely um, uh, radical right wing. Um, but I will say one thing about that. There is a bit of a potential sleight of hand here in the sense that you can have parties that offer left wing policies that pursue kind of what may appear as left wing populism. As soon as they start evoking ethno uh, uh, ethno religious exclusion, we relabel them as right wing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, uh, the Law and Justice Party in Poland uh, piece, um, they're, they're in favor of redistribution um, and they're very much populist, but because of their strong Islamophobic, um, uh, anti-Semitic uh, and anti-minority uh, politics, they tend to be labeled as radical right. Um, so how do we square that? I think one way to think about it is that the political continuum that we tend to operate with, left, right, you know, these are shorthands, um, is not just about left versus right economic policy. It's also about uh, liberal versus conservative, conservative uh, cultural ideology. And so um, the right, quote unquote, is often identified with conservatism with the desire to maintain traditions, with the desire to maintain traditional um, group hierarchies as well. And to the degree that that um, has racial, ethnic, and religious content, um, it, it becomes sort of a, a right-wing uh, phenomenon to try to pr preserve, let's say, the status of white majorities in a country. So I think that's why quite often the parties that we're describing are viewed as radical right, even if their economic policies may actually be uh, more redistributive. Uh, Professor Dufour, I'd love to have you weigh in on that as well, uh, you know, specifically around uh, what's driving this rise of populism, not only on the far right, but also across the political spectrum. And what are the, some of the common characteristics, perhaps, and how do they differ? Well, I'd like to insist on, on one element of um, that that Bart talked about, which I, I think is very important to keep in mind when we talk about left-wing populism, is that populists see the elite as inherently corrupted. So it's not only that, like someone who says that there, there's too much inequalities, for instance, is not necessarily a, po a populist, okay? Or someone who says there's too much corruption is not necessarily a populist. It has to be something more, you know? The, the elite have to be inherently uh, corrupted because they take part in the liberal political process. And this is a, a very important distinction between like a, a traditional social democrat and a left-wing populist who, who is, is doing something uh, quite different. And they have a very different understanding of what we do about this. Because for, for a, a traditional social democrat, for instance, uh, who, who sees a, a corruption scandal, uh, the, the 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 normal reaction would be oh, uh, that's good we have good journalists we have a great public sphere and these people are bringing about like news that we should hear about it's not about oh the elites are all corrupt so we need to 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 shift to an authoritarian regime okay so it's a very different mindset um so what are the general components Unfortunately, I agree with a lot of what Bart said. Okay, so I, I just want to maybe bring uh, some complementary information. Um, you know, I think that most of the people who adhere to populist ideology um, have lost faith in pluralism. Okay, and this is something that we can, when Bart was talking about nationalism, we're not talking here about state-seeking nationalism. Okay, we're not talking about Catalonia, about uh, about Scotland. We're talking about um, a, a form of nationalism which believes that pluralism has gone too far. Okay, so we have a group of people who believe that they are entitled to the state. Uh, they are that they are the earthland of the state, and that they are the one who are in charge of restoring the, the 
the correct balance between ethnic order and institutional order. So the, the, they've lost faith in two forms of pluralism, ethnic pluralism, and this is something that has been going on for a long time in Western Europe, for instance. We knew that um, the, in, in several surveys, people are most uh, are mostly op opposed to immigration than the electoral turnout for anti-immigration parties. Okay, now it's it's more in line with with both are more in line, but is it has been a long trend, and they are opposed to institutional pluralism as well. So all the counter power that we have in a liberal democracy, um, they, seized, they see this as inefficient, as too slow, as um, serving only the elite, not serving the ordinary people. And therefore there's, there, there's a need to shift to something else, okay? Um, they see also insti liberal institution as serving sometime hidden interests, okay? And this is where conspiracy theory kicks in, okay? You know, you know liberal institution are serving big pharma, um, uh, the World Trade Organization or the Jews, okay? It can go that far in, in some case. So, uh, this is the first aspect, loss of trust in pluralism. Then there is a loss of trust in life trajectory. Okay, when we ask people the question, um, do you think your country is going in the right direction? Most populists are saying no. Okay, and the in there is an increase of people who think, believe that their country is not going in the right direction. Then there's an another very inter interesting question is, do you believe that uh, life will be easier for your children or is life easier for you than it was for your parents? And a lot of people, an increasing number of people answer no to this question. Okay, so they believe that their life is um, is not going to be as easy as, as their parents' life. Okay, so that's another signal that we need to look at. And this is especially true as, as Bart emphasized among a certain status group, okay, not necessarily class, okay, so it's not necessarily people who have low income who believe that life is not going in the right direction, okay, it's people who have a social status with, which is not very prestigious, okay, so they don't have a college education, they don't have a university degree, um, and they feel that they could be replaced by uh, uh, a labor market transformation or um, a transformation because because of positive affirmation policy, for instance. So these people are like most of them, the people who, who will adhere to populist formation. And of course, there, there are regional variation. Okay, when we talk about Eastern and Central Europe, um, the transition from from communist to post-communist society has been has created a lot of loser and winners. Okay, so this is like a peculiar regional variation. Um, Canada is another interesting case where so far it's not so bad, um, but there's another case like Brazil, India. Uh, where we see these phenomenon growing also. And we really need to look at the, what's the, the specificity of the local politics in these country. That's that's absolutely fascinating. Um, perhaps what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll turn my question, my next question to both of you. Uh, and Professor Dufour, perhaps I'll ask you to, to hit a, to start us off. Um, you know, are there different thresholds of populism that are less consequential? And what kind of warning signs should we be looking for? You know, I think you've hinted at some of them. You're seeing a lot of that, uh, you know, the wedge issues that are starting on the rise or the economic disparity. But what are some of those warning signs that we should be looking for? Okay. Well, the different threshold, it, it, it happens that Bart and I both agree that to, to define populism as an ideology, okay? Some people define populism just as a style, okay? And 
when we when we look at populism as a style, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, for instance, uh, politicians which goes to a Tim Horton in order to look more like popular or who goes to a hockey game. This is like, this is political marketing. Okay. We can say that this is populism as a style, but this is not a, a threat necessarily to democracy. Um, where we start to see a danger is these very vague accusation that the elites are inherently corrupt, uh, that the people are inherently virtuous. And when we start to leave the realm of politics for the realm of morality, okay, this is like a, a dangerous shift. Uh, when we start to denounce counterpower, the judge, the media, a scientist, um, public health officer, this is dangerous. This is like the beginning of something else where we don't want to go. Professor Bonacaski, perhaps I'll ask you to weigh in on that as well. I just, I'll ask you to turn off your mic though. It always my happens. Apologies. Every my my apologies. It was inevitable. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, thank you for these terrific comments. I agree with, of, of, with much of what you just said. Um, I think one way to think, there are two ways to think about the threshold question. The first is really about um, the degree to which the phenomena that we see on the radical right appear in mainstream politics as well. And, and I think there is there are echoes. So for instance, populist claims, a way of sort of vilifying elites and, and juxtaposing them with the virtuous people, this kind of moral binary, um, it, it does exist in, in mainstream politics. Uh, in my own work, I've seen evidence of it in, in mainstream U.S. presidential discourse, for example, um, uh, both on the left and the right, actually. So it's, you know, again, this is not just something that the Republican Party. Democrats rely on quite often, especially when running for elections from uh, um, and when the, particularly among candidates for challengers from outside of, of, of the kind of center of power, they quite often will vilify uh, the political establishment uh, and other elites uh, and argue that people should regain power. Uh, and those attempts are, are often reductive in various ways. They kind of simplify the, the actual complexity of politics, but they do quite often reflect real grievances in, in the public um, and, and also just the position of the candidate uh, in the political system um, without undermining necessarily the legitimacy of the opposition and, and thereby uh, uh, liberal democratic institutions. So there is a difference in the way that that populism is, is used by mainstream candidates versus radical candidates. And I think that's consistent with what Frederick was just saying. Um, if we think about the other two components of, of radicalism, uh, radical right politics, so authoritarianism, well, this gets a little dicier in the sense that there's plenty of evidence uh, of the use of authoritarian claims and the, the pursuit of authoritarian policies by quote unquote mainstream politicians. And so uh, uh, this is uh, this has been problematic over the course of, of democratic history, right? So I think few would claim that we should favorably look back on Japanese internment, right? Or on kind of the, the, the federal government in Canada sort of turning a blind eye to residential schools or to McCarthyism in the United States, the war on drugs, um, or the punitive movement toward mass incarceration in the United States has been absolutely damaging to the social fabric of this country and, 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 and is deeply racialized. Um, or for that matter, the Muslim travel ban uh, that Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump put forward. So, so these policies have been, these are authoritarian policies. These are policies that were in, for most part um, put in place by politicians that whom we would otherwise think of as mainstream. Um, but I, I guess one way to draw the line is this, these policies as, as awful and uh, objectionable as they were uh, stopped short of dismantling democracy as a whole, right? So uh, they eroded democracy. They often involved things like voter disenfranchisement, but they did not necessarily directly challenge the results of electoral, uh, of, of democratic elections, for instance. Um, and so, the, you know, there is a slippery slope here. It's not exactly a sharp line between the mainstream use of authoritarianism, authoritarianism and, uh, and its radical dimension. And then the last dimension, the last uh, aspect of, of these politics that I mentioned earlier, uh, this kind of ethno-nationalism, here again, you know, mainstream politicians are not completely off the hook. Quite often, we've we've seen campaigns by politicians um, um, who, who try to who try to uh, uh, stir up uh, racial resentments, um, ethno-nationalist resentments, uh, and sometimes they instill policies of that sort once in power. But quite often, these are just electoral strategies, and, and so they talk the talk but they don't necessarily walk the walk, at least not as fully as more radical politicians. Um, and so I think the difference between these mainstream candidates and, and politicians uh, using these kinds of frames and policies 
uh, versus radical parties is that what radical candidates do is combine all of this. They bring together the populism, the authoritarianism, the ethno-nationalism, they turn up the volume, and they really mean what they say. That is, once in power, they actually pursue uh, in, in the policy domain all of these uh, promises. Um, and so that, I think, is, is an important difference be between the radical right and the mainstream. Um, and so uh, you know, when, when the radical right is pursuing these policies, it actually damages liberal democratic institutions in a direct way. But, um, but there is one thing to say about this uh, that, again, does not let, let the mainstream politicians off the hook. Even if their use of populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism isn't quite as extreme uh, as that on the, on the radical uh, right or sometimes radical left, um, it has a secondary danger of legitimating these frames. Um, so once you start doing populist talk, if you're a mainstream politician, you're now making that part of the repertoire, available repertoire of political frames. Uh, same with nationalism and authoritarianism. And later on, somebody who's much more radical can come along and make use of these existing cultural materials to very different ends. Uh, and and they and those those cultural frames will then already have a resonance because they've been heard before and they've been successful before. Um, so that's that's the main answer. I'll say one last very brief thing about this kind of question about the threshold of populism. So beyond what threshold in terms of elections might we worry about, say, radical right parties or in some other countries, maybe radical left parties. And I think here we should be thinking about institutional differences between different democratic systems in different, um, in different countries. Uh, so in multi-party parliamentary systems, like in Western Europe, there is kind of a safety valve built in uh, by virtue of, of, of new parties being able to stand on their own, get, get their own electoral support. Uh, and quite often, these are these are small radical parties that get somewhere between 5, 15% of the vote. I mean, 15 is obviously not no longer that small, but it's not 50, right? Um, and in those electoral systems, these parties must enter coalitions in order to govern. And these coalitions can sometimes have uh, a dampening effect on the kind of radicalism of these smaller, more extremist parties. Whereas in countries like the United States, where you've got a two-party system, mm -hmm. the stakes are much higher, right? You've got a, one of these two parties was actually captured by the extremist wing, right? By Donald Trump uh, and by other candidates be, uh, before and after him who supported his policies. And the result is that more moderate Republicans kind of had to line up behind Trump because he delivered them a victory. I mean, had to. They chose to, but the incentives were were clearly pointing in that direction. And so here we can think of your threshold question as sort of what what, what beyond what threshold does the representation of more extremist views in the population become a challenge to liberal democratic institutions? And I think again, the difference there is institutional between different countries. I really appreciate your point about you know socializing over time these polarizing policies. Once the toothpaste is out of the tube, it really is hard to push it back in. I think that's a that's a really interesting point of view, and certainly for someone who works um, you know on on democracy as part of my job, you know we we think about statistics like you know Freedom House and sixteen years of backsliding in terms of democratic you know liberal liberal democratic. Um, Backsliding. And so I'm always keen to think about the indicators and what we can keep an eye on from a policy perspective as well. Um, so thanks for that. Um, and I guess the next question is sort of linked to that. I get, you know, what lessons can we learn from the past or, or from the contemporary examples you've given, particularly uh, when we're thinking about, you know, the times of economic insecurity in which we live or the lower levels of democratic participation that have sort of plagued uh, many, many elections around the world, uh, including, you know, our in our own country here. Um, what kind of the lessons can we learn and, and are there best practices for us to think about? Uh, I'll start with you, Professor Bonikowski. Great. Uh, there are many lessons, although uh, it's always difficult to draw a direct line from historical cases to the present, and one can oversimplify. But one thing we know is that uh, times of crisis can breed extremism. Uh, and so uh, precarious economic conditions often lend themselves to scapegoating. Uh, and when t things are bad, you know, uh, there's a lot of incentive for, for political entrepreneurs to point the finger at the existing political elites and the populist piece, but also at um, minorities. And so, you know, when, it, when there are economic recessions, um, quite often ethno-nationalist resentments um, get a boost uh, in the sense that people want to blame somebody. Uh, and it is often convenient 
for political elites to say, well, it's not us. It's, you know, it's the immigrants that are stealing your jobs or it's the other party that is that has created the problem. Elect us and we'll solve we'll solve your issues. Um, but it's not just about economically precarious times. It's also, as I mentioned in the talk earlier, about uh, perceptions of, of other kinds of change, cultural change, demographic change, uh, anything that that alters the social hierarchies that people are used to. Um, so all of these kinds of uh, perceptions of change can can again breed extremism, and they can give give rise to um, to the support for ethno nationalist populist radical politics. Um, Another feature that sometimes we tend to forget about is security crises. So um, there's a long history of, of people turning inward and, and constructing domestic enemies when there is a threat from without. So if we think about interwar Germany, would give rise to fascism, right? It's about economic crisis, it's about political crisis, it's also about perceptions of, uh, of, 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 uh, of international military conflict uh, after the World War, the First World War. If we think about Japanese internment in the United States, right? It's again, J Japan is an enemy, therefore Japanese Americans are an enemy. It's, you know, it's a pretty pretty uh, short line between those two um, two kinds of vilification. Um, McCarthyism and the Red Scare, and kind of hunting for communists within, right, in the government, uh, in, in entertainment institutions, and uh, in the entertainment industry, and so forth. Or more recently, the post 9/11, and you know, a wave of Islamophobia that I would argue shaped much of the politics that with which we're living today, actually. So even though the, the George W. Bush administration actually tried to put the brakes on kind of a, on mass Islamophobia and a kind of reactionary uh, turn uh, uh, against minorities after 9-11, um, the, those currents, uh, I think, changed the nature of, of, uh, of Republican politics, actually, uh, and shaped uh, to some degree the trajectory to, uh, that points to today's politics. Um, the other thing that I think we, maybe two things that we know from history. One is that um, quite often the scapegoating, the vilification of, of, of minorities um, slides very quickly into the abuse of state power against vulnerable groups, as well as to, toward quotidian and political violence. So it's not just about saying, oh, blame those people, and that's where it ends. Quite often, there's a direct set, set of policies that, uh, that uh, infringe upon the rights and the freedoms of, of minority um, group members. And then also, again, this violence by, by the majority against the minority is something that, that follows quite quickly. So I think that one set of lessons has to do with, sort of, with scapegoating and grievances. Um, another set of lessons is, has to do with the guardrails of democracy. Who can stop? this backsliding from continuing uh, and who's sort of responsible for fanning the flames. And here, you know, I, I want to say that um, now one thing obviously that we should care about is just the robustness of democratic institutions. To what degree are democratic institutions based on norms that are easily violated versus laws that require a more concerted effort to, uh, to be overturned? And we've learned in the, in the United States in the last, uh, you know, uh, I guess at this point, six years that actually uh, a lot of what we thought were, were institutions in the sense of having a legal legal founding to them are just norms. And if somebody like Trump comes along and just decides to violate them, he can actually get away with it. And there isn't much legally that can be done about it. Um, so um, we can get to solutions later, but as a hint, you know, showing up democratic institutions and protecting them through uh, legal measures is really important. It's not foolproof in a sense that you know, in Hungary, Orban just changed the constitution. Um, but it takes a lot more to get there than to just sort of, you know, um, um, violate the norms themselves. Um, and the other mechanism is the role of par mainstream parties uh, in preventing us from getting to the point of democratic backsliding and then slowing down or stopping the backsliding once we're there. And here I think the blame can go both to the left and the right. So there's plenty of work in political science that suggests that part of the reason why we got here is that the center left has at some point essentially abdicated their responsibility for the working class um, and for yeah, um, uh, you know uh, the economically vulnerable. That it, from the 80s onward, really in the 90s, kind of third wave politics meant that the center left became neoliberal, um, started favoring um, urban elites over the uh, over the interests of the working class, and and part of that left the unmooring of people from the existing political um, um, commitments and and kind of left them. Um, in some ways, open to the to the to the mobilization by more radical uh, extremists. Um, along alongside the the crisis of social uh, democracy, we also have the erosion of labor unions. They used to give people a sense of I mentioned this during the talk. They used to give people a sense of meaning. Once that goes away, again, people are much more susceptible to to radicalization. Um, 
But the blame also goes to the center left, right? In the sense that um, the, the past work by, by scholars like Daniel Ziblatt, for instance, have shown that in historical moments, um, like the rise of fascism in Germany, um, the final bulwark of democracy is the center right. In the sense that the center right has a choice to make. Do we stand for democratic institutions and oppose the radical extremism to the right of us? Or do we get into a political competition where we try to poach some of the voters that are now favoring the radical extremist right uh, and get essentially, and basically jump on the radical bandwagon. Uh, and that is a choice that is extremely important. And disappointingly in many countries, the center right has shifted toward the radical right because the incentives again are aligned up in a way where they, they wanna play the game of anti-immigrant uh, uh, politics in order to gain the voters that are drifting rightward more toward the extreme. But the cost of that you know, is quite often the stability of liberal democratic institutions. Thanks very much. Professor Dufour, perhaps I'll ask you to add something to that. Yeah, well, again, I agree with most, much of what, what Bart said, but there, there, is, there is a tricky element to that question, okay? Because there, there are historian sociologists and political scientists who are trying to look at, okay, are we, are we noticing the rise of fascism again? Okay, and I think that that's the danger when we we'll, there's a danger to look at the question this way. Okay, because if we end up with the answer, okay, no, this is not exactly fascism. I mean, these people still want to play like inside a party system, and they're not necessarily pro military and so on. Um, what do we do about it? Does that mean that it's it's not a it's not a big deal? Uh, yes, it is. It it is a big deal. Okay, so we have to be careful with with this this way of framing the question and of what we can learn from the past. Because because so far, when we look at the the result of what happened during the Trump mandate and during Bolsonaro in in Brazil, uh, we can say that. Um, some some things that happened were very bad. Well, I'm not I'm not talking only about the, the democratic democratic institution, but also life expectancy. Um, the the way they've closed a blind eyes on a public health issue, a public health crisis. This is something completely new. It's something we cannot learn necessarily from the past, but it is something that is completely in line with negating. Um, advice from the, the bureaucrats, the academia, the researcher, and so on. Same thing with the envir environmental mm -hmm. crisis. I mean, okay. they don't they don't look at it. They don't think it's important. It's not it's not an issue. I mean, and and this is also um, a problem. So I think what we can learn from the past is, uh, as Bart said, that things can always get worse. Okay, so when we have like there's there's uh, fans of Bernie Sanders who are saying, okay, I'm not voting for Hillary because I she doesn't represent me. I mean, no, I mean you have to vote. I mean, even if you don't agree with everything, um, it can get much worse to, uh, all the time. Okay, um, and this is something we need to and to to keep in mind. Okay, that to, it's not about just. Um, the old traditional Republican Party we're, we're talking about. We're talking about the rule of the game who can completely change now with, with this kind this type of formation. And there's no way, there's no easy way to go back once the rules have changed. Well, I, I don't want us to, to stay on too bleak of a note, but so perhaps we'll turn towards um, more of the solutions oriented kind of frame for the, the last part of our conversation. Um, per, Professor Dufour, perhaps I'll ask you to start on this one. Um, you know, what are the broad implications for policymakers and public institutions uh, when we think about, you know, increasing populist movements? We've talked about, you know, the robust guardrails that we require and the need for formalizing some of the norms that um, you know, we've we've perhaps taken for granted, but you know, what are what are the implications for policymakers who are who are listening in or, or watching this uh, webcast today? Well, there's implication um, in terms that things are not going to get better soon, and that they will still be. Um, target of prejudice act actually like we've seen uh, in last February in Canada. 
Um, but let's go back to the main message here is that we need to, to go back to the idea that liberal democracy are not perfect, uh, that everyone's trying to do their best, but that democracy is messy, okay? And that there's no easy solution to anything. So even when Bart was talking about the fact that the mainstream also has to be careful, it, it the mainstream has to be careful when they say, when they use like the repertoire of the far right, but also when they present politics as an easy process, as and solution as something which every everything can be done. Okay, it, it's not the case. Um, inequalities are part of a, a process of globalization, which is not going to go away tomorrow. Okay, and no nation state can just pull out of the process easily. Um, what could be done in terms of public policy? I, I think emphasizing public education, civic education is something that should be on the agenda. Um, continuing education, okay, this is also something that should be on the agenda. And I'm, I'm talking about this, this status group, okay, of, of, so this group of people who are earning some, like middle class or higher middle class wage, like around 80,000, 70,000 in Canada and have a high school degree, okay? We need to make sure that these people have access to continuing education to make sure that they, they keep a sense that they control their future, okay? That if something bad happened, if there's a, if there's a recession, at least they're gonna have the, the tools to rebuild their lives. Okay, so th this is something that would I would put an emphasis on and um, reducing inequality, of course. We see less of these movements in societies where there's less inequalities. Um, Professor Bonakowski, I'll ask you to weigh in there, but right before I do, I'll, I'll say, you know, one of the things that I spend a lot of time thinking about is about the importance of teaching debate at a young age, you know, it's critical thinking, absolutely, it's civic education, so important, uh, but the, the teaching of how to bring um, diverse perspectives together, how to find common ground, which is so critical, and uh, from a deb debate nerd like myself, uh, you know, I think it's just such a, an interesting mechanism for us to think about in trying to bridge these gaps. But Professor Bonikowski, over to you. Yeah, as usual, I agree with what Patrick said. I think one thing I just want to mention is this, this idea that democracy is not easy. I think that's really important. And in fact, it's part of the explanation for the rise of radicalism, let's say, in Eastern Europe. You know, countries that in 1990, uh, post-communist countries, all of a sudden became democratic. Um, and Part of the reason why they've turned towards populist radical right parties is that they found democracy to be hard, right? There was a, in a lot of Eastern European countries, no party would remain in power for longer than one term. There was kind of this anti-incumbent sentiment because it turned out that they didn't offer all the solutions very quickly. Uh, there was a lot of kind of lingering also post, uh, post-Soviet, post-communist, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, complication there. But but the other thing is that it turned out the, that neoliberal democracy is particularly difficult. And I think that also gets to quite a big point. The neoliberalism breeds inequality and breeds, uh, you know, not not all not all boats are rising. And so I think in countries like Poland uh, and other countries uh, in, in Eastern Europe, people realized, you know, this is not just paradise. It's actually hard. It's hard to do good policy. It's hard to realize that um, that democratic elections don't solve all problems immediately. Um, and I think to the degree that we can remind people of this on a regular basis and prevent them from turning against uh, democratic institutions, that's important, but again, easier said than done. And a couple of other things to react to, Federic, um, this notion that um, this is not about partisanship. I want to really repeat this. It's not about left versus right. It's actually, actually the solution is to get back to meaningful partisanship, to have meaningful debate between center left and center right parties, um, but a debate that does not call into question democratic institutions themselves. It can be a, 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 there can be strong disagreements about the right course for the country. There can be strong disagreements, certainly about policy, but there should be no disagreement about whether democratic institutions are worth saving. And I think quite often these debates around radical right politics can be misunderstood as a sort of left wing uh, kind of liberal uh, um, critiques of just regular center right parties. That's not the case. Uh, I think that what we need to get to is a point where both 
uh, conservatives and liberals are on the same side side of the fight when it comes to protecting democratic institutions. Um, and, and part of that actually, given our setting here in this discussion is about protecting the independence of public servants, um, right? Uh, this is a huge challenge. When extremist candidates and extremist parties come to power, one of the first things they do is try to co-opt civil service, the public service, and turn who are otherwise independent uh, 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 you know, employees of the state who are working to continue, uh, you know, providing government services to the population, they try to co-opt them and turn them into political, uh, um, into political operatives. And that is something that's very dangerous. Um, so I think one of the things we want to do is try to, in some ways, shore up our democratic institutions so that, so that they're resistant to uh, potential inroads made by more authoritarian candidates. So when somebody like Trump comes along, let's say, sure, okay, he gets elected because that's what the people want, fine. But, but the danger that he poses should be to some ways circumvented by the strength of the democratic institutions themselves. Again, easier said than done. Uh, mm -hmm. There was an attempt to, to do that, but of course the, 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 the party that was Trump's party at the time resisted uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the passing of policies that would protect elections, that would protect the, the, the peaceful turnover of power. Um, uh, Frederick, I think you wanted to jump in there, so maybe I'll see it back to you. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I just want to push you on what uh, Aisha said as well, that the, um, the art of the debate is that we agree to disagree. And, and this is very easy when polarization do not overlap. You know, in, in a civil society where there's multiple polarization, uh, it's very good, okay, because they don't they don't necessarily overlap. So one day, like on this type of policy, policy, this person is your opponent, but, but on another, another issue, this person can be on your side. What we see in the U.S. right now is that all these polarization are overlapping and people cease to see the the their antagonist as an opponent, but they see them as an enemy and as an enemy, which is not legitimate anymore. I, I mean, and if you have to choose between this enemy, which is not legitimate or an authoritarian ruler, people prefer to go on on the uh, authoritarian rule. So this is what is very tricky. You know, polarization is the essence of democracy. So we should not try to avoid debate or avoid polarization. But we need to make sure that they they change. I mean, they they they, they, they don't overlap. Yeah, that's um, absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, perhaps then I'll turn to sort of our next question, and it's related to this last one. Um, but you know, as I think about. Um, the types of policy responses or best practices or promising practices that you've seen, well, what kind of policy responses could be implemented to help bridge those gaps and, and to bridge uh, the different divides that are feeding populism? Have you seen anything through your research that, you know, Canadian uh, policymakers uh, should be thinking about? Uh, Professor Bonakowski, I'll start with you on this one. You ended with the hardest question, and I've got to <laughs> say, I don't study policy per se, and quite often uh, social scientists are really bad at offering policy solutions, right? So we write our books, and then somebody says, oh, you should write that last chapter about policy recommendations, and that's sort of an afterthought. Uh, not everyone's like this, but I, I certainly am guilty of it. So I would just say that... Um, Again, this is all very hard, but I think in addition to shoring up democratic institutions, I think our mainstream parties need to start offering meaningful, me, meaningful solutions to real real everyday problems that, that voters experience, right? And, and that's easier said than done. Um, but, but voters have real grievances, including voters who are supporting populist radical right politicians. Um, you know, I mentioned these are sometimes economic grievances, sometimes they're cultural grievances. Uh, there are a whole slew of them, uh, but they get channeled into outgroup resentments. And if there will be some way of essentially stopping that process from going from what are what are material and 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 real everyday grievances into outgroup vilification, that would help, right? And so one way to do that is to propose policies that help people address those everyday problems. This is partly about uh, uh, inequality, as Frederick was saying, um, but, but offering, offering a vision, right? And a vision that's powerful, a vision that allows people to imagine a better future for themselves, for their children, um, and it kind of brings us back to other topics of conversation. I mean, essentially what we wanna do ideally in, in elections is to argue about policies that have to do with solving problems, not 
argue about nationalism, not argue about is the United States the country that belongs to white Christians or is the country that belongs to, uh, you know, a pluralistic, multicultural um, a mosaic? Um, I, I think those are important conversations to have. But I, but I think when they're the only thing we're talking about, they just lead us down the same path that we're on right now when it becomes very difficult to turn back. Um, the, I think the difficulty here is that that this kind of recommendation can be misunderstood. Um, some people argue we shouldn't talk about culture. We shouldn't talk about minority rights. We should just talk about economic issues. I think that's actually not what I'm saying. I think it's really important to have it both ways and to understand that economic justice is also racial justice. It's also you know justice when it comes to religious difference, um, and that uh, that 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 parties of the left should not be ceding territory in terms of protecting the rights and liberties of minorities, but they should combine those protections with a meaningful economic vision and a meaningful policy vision, and more broadly speaking, uh, that can that can offer a different future. So I think I think you know again <laughs> in the in the world that of of mass polarization, all of this is easier, easier said than done. Because no matter how reasonable a proposal from one side is, the other side often um, uh, opposes it just by virtue of, of, it, of, of it being kind of the, the policy of the enemy. And so I think in some ways what Frederick's point uh, suggests is that a solution to the policy problem has to go somehow, has to also be a solution to the polarization problem. The fact that we have all of these different identities, policy areas uh, kind of lining up, at least in the United States, on two sides where there's just very little room for bipartisanship and very little room for meaningful debate. Um, and, and I'm afraid that there isn't an obvious solution to that. That's um, uh, uh, doc, uh, Professor Dufour. Um, any remarks you'd like to add to that? Any points you're thinking about? Yeah, again, I agree. I mean, if there was a solution, we would see it. I mean, we would see like... Uh, social democratic formation coming back. And actually, the Social Democratic Party did manage to come back in power in Germany. Okay, and this is one of the cases that we could look at. And um, it did come back to power with a leader which is not charismatic at all uh, in, in top of that. So that's interesting. And one of the things he did is exactly what uh, Bart was talking about. He started talking about like a, a return to more social democratic uh, policy, which were, um, and he managed to get back the working class to the party, which is something that has been, um, that the, the left has lost for a long time. Like most worker now vote for the right. So that that's something that, that is interesting. Um, one of the mistake that the people should stop doing um, is what, what, I, what, I'm, what I'm teaching about this. I, I call it the basket of deplorables mistake. We should stop talking like the, oh, I don't know what's how, how you say that in English, but um, taking a, a higher moral ground when we, when we talk to populists. I mean, we need to really um, take their, their fear seriously, uh, their desire to belong, to be recognized seriously. And uh, this, this we, we need to stop to just um, laugh at laugh at this. Okay, this is something that we, we need to change or the way we talk to these people. Um, other solution that I, I is, is, that are, aren't easy, but I would like to see more dialogue between uh, people from urban and rural areas. I mean, I would, I don't know if we could like send schools program to rural areas to, to talk to, 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 to bridge, uh, to bridge this divide. I mean, people from urban area need to understand what kind of social problem uh, people in rural area are facing. And I would say the same for inter intergenerational problem. Uh, most young people, younger people don't understand how older people see the world and vice versa. And we need to have more dialogue also on, on that, on this axis. So yeah, it's not, it's no easy solution, but it is still related to public policy in education that we can bring about for like on the short term. 
So what I'm hearing is a closer level of engagement, some intercultural or, or diversity, or, or you know, bring diverse points of view together for dialogue. Uh, dialogue really seeming to form the, the basis of, of uh, how to make progress in, in bringing and bridging some of those different perspectives together, uh, hopefully with some constructive and positive outcomes. Um, perhaps to end, I'll, I'll ask each of you to provide us your, some closing thoughts um, about uh, where you know where you where we've come from and where we should be thinking about going, and of, of course you know some highlighting some of the key points that you've uh, made today for each of us. Uh, Professor Bonikowski, perhaps I'll ask you to start on this one. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I've said a lot, so I, I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to summarize it all. But I think just just to say that we're in a precarious moment, and when I say we, I don't mean Canadians, Americans. I really mean citizens of democratic uh, countries. You know, I think there was a a, a sense that 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 history mo was moving in a linear fashion in the in the second half of the 20th century, right? This kind of narrative, teleological narrative of progress uh, that you know everything's trending toward democracy, towards uh, greater pluralism, greater uh, uh, kind of uh, political harmony, um, and uh, and I think the post-Soviet moment when sort of the you know uh, when the world changed from a bilateral one to initially unilateral, then multilateral, uh, kind of just perpetuated people's sense that, you know, things are getting better and better. And it turns out actually that it's a lot more complicated than that. And, and I think one thing that time will tell is whether um, the current moment is sort of a, a moment of maybe correction, reckoning, uh, but, 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 but a detour, and then we're gonna return back to a, a, a trajectory that is more hopeful, or um, whether the post-war period was actually an aberration. Um, and maybe, you know, the kind of the chaos that we're seeing, starting to see today, maybe that's the norm. Um, and so, you know, I have no prognostication on this front. I, I hope for the former and, and hope against the latter. Um, you know, uh, democracies have dealt with all kinds of difficult problems in the past, and perhaps this is just one kind of growing pain. Uh, and maybe, as Patrick was saying, this is partly about the fact that Maybe maybe the left has gotten a little too um, you know too elitist and maybe a little bit too uh, bounded uh, off from 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 parts of the population that have real grievances uh, and maybe this is the corrective right and and once once we get back on the same page maybe we can move forward on a more concerted matter together uh, so I think I think there's there's some possible hope there um, the other final thing to say is this, we very briefly uh, I think this came up but the problem of climate change right. Um, this is an existential problem for humanity. Um, and one would hope that when humanity faces existential problems, we can set some differences aside, both internally within countries and internationally, geopolitically between countries, and start thinking about common solutions. And maybe, right, the hopeful possibility is that as, these, as the climate gets worse, which it will, maybe of coming together around these kinds of solutions. Um, but on the other hand, again, you know, we've seen with COVID, which is a pretty big crisis, that 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 didn't happen necessarily everywhere. Uh, and the problem with climate change is that it leads to scarcity, leads to greater inequality, it leads to potential uh, turmoil on the ground that could reverberate through the global um, uh, system of, of, of nation states. So again, we'll see. Um, but I think I think the crises that are facing us are dire enough uh, that that we should be thinking about how to how to move forward together and how to shore up the institutions that seem to work well, democratic, liberal, democratic institutions. Professor Dufour, over to you for some closing thoughts. Yeah, well, I can end on something a little bit more hopeful, is that when we look at survey and like support for the liberal values and so on, in many countries where facing like radical right movement, the younger generation do support liberal values and norms. I mean, it, it's not a big like a big issue. The problem is that they don't vote. Um, so it, we don't have, we, we should not like lose too much time trying to convince them that it's important to to save democracy. Like, I mean, they usually they agree with that. Um, it's the level of cynicism that we need to fight among this generation to bring that to bring them to the poll station and to vote and then to get involved and to agree that they, they're going to lose sometime and that this is part of, of the game i mean they, they, they're going to lose it but we have to as we said earlier to agree with to disagree on some key issues 
but vote. That, that is an extremely hopeful message, I think, uh, for us to, to close out on for today. Um, I'd like to start by, by thanking you both for participating in this session today. Uh, Professor Bonikowski, I thought, you know, the, the framework that you laid out at the front end was deeply thought provoking. Um, a really uh, clear sort of framework that we can think about and, and see different elements as they're playing out in reality. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I thought your point around uh, the fundamental disagreement about a, what a national identity is, uh, is something that we really need to think about as policymakers, because we have a role in trying to form that and our actions, especially uh, from the government side, help to either build support for a national identity or pull away from it. Uh, and I and I like the way that you were talking about, you know, shoring up institutions is one of our core ways of being able to protect against some of the radical um, elements that are that we're seeing more and more of uh, today. And Professor Dufour, you know, I, I was reflecting on your points around the loss of support for pluralism. And of course, that, you know, democracy work is really hard. Uh, it's, it's not something that uh, we're going to be able to solve overnight, which certainly gives me comfort as someone working on democracy, because we certainly have not solved that yet. Uh, but that more collective action, particularly by, you know, youth, uh, if you're seeing that element show up, uh, is how we're going to, you know, and bringing more voices to the table is really how we're going to come out uh, in a better place. So I'd like to thank you both for participating in today's uh, discussion. Uh, thank you. Merci, Miigwech. Um, uh, of course, I'd also just very quickly like to thank our technical support and um, our, the tech team at the Canada School of Public Service for putting on this dialogue uh, and for all of our participants for, for tuning in today. Thank you for uh, participating and for listening in. Uh, please keep a close eye on the website of the Canada School of Public Service in the new year for future um, uh, elements of this series around the future of democracy. Uh, hopefully hopefully um, there will be lots more interesting uh, discussions to come. So thank you both again and have a wonderful afternoon.